bang. No, just get... I, I just want, I just want as much as possible to look at. Okay. At the same time, you know, it is fun. Like when I go into my safe, sometimes I'll just kind of reach in the stash and like, yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah. No, you understand. Definitely. Oh yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. folks, welcome to another redneck live. Oh, we're here to talk about some shooting. I'm such a turd. On deck tonight, Mr. Andreas. Say hello. Hey, party people. And Mr. Park. Hello. One of the Korean brothers. One of the Korean brothers, the, sorry. One of the I, one half of the Korean brotherhood. I had to go get more liquid courage. I didn't know you were going to hit record. Yeah, you're going to need some liquid courage there, buddy. A real piece of work. All right, guys. We're talking about teaching. That's the topic today. Uh, so all of us have been pretty active this year teaching. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Mr. Park, you're the most active you've ever been. True. I'm about regular active, which is very active by normal people. Mm -hmm. They're teaching 30, 40 classes a year. It's Mr. Kind of Andreas, a job. you're doing, you're doing one a month, right? Yeah. I do a open enrollment a month and then some private training on top of that. All right. I want to talk about what we learned teaching this year. Okay. That's what I want to talk about. And that has a couple different angles. It does. Uh, so the big change this year that I made my classes was use of these black pasters or painted on aim points, like small, about the size of a paster, but using aim points on targets intermittently in classes. That was the biggest change I made to get people target focused. You know, to highlight for them, hey, you're target focused, you're not, you know, here's what's happening. Use, using that. Um, I think, Joel, I think I told you before the start of the year, I said, hey, this is going to be the dot occlusion of 2022. You when did we, say uh, that. are using these points. And in your experience, would you say that's what happened? It has, although it hasn't annoyed as many people, but it's been really good. Hasn't been an oh dot occlusion was annoying to many yeah yeah that didn't understand it that was really. part of the fun yeah they just didn't get it it's like hey tell me you don't get it without saying you don't get it yeah exactly I mean that was a few people yeah okay so that's been useful mm -hmm. Mr Andreas what change have you made in your classes that you think has been useful I think a big one has been realizing that. Not everybody is naturally visualizing what they're doing before they do it and being a lot more explicit about starting to walk people through that from the beginning. Interesting. Can you tell, tell me more about that? Like, so explain. So there's a few ideas to unpack there for people. So you're talking about visualizing and then people aren't being as explicit as they ought to be. So we should talk about that. Yeah. And then you should talk about the correction. You know, yeah, what so do you actually feed to people that that works? One of the best piece of student feedbacks I got was setting up and having a having all the students run a drill cold in the morning and then doing that same thing in the afternoon once we're done. So I started setting up a little 10 round mini field course for everybody to shoot. And I didn't realize how good that would be in terms of not just watching the students shoot it, but what they do before they shoot it. So I'll walk over and explain the drill, like you're gonna start here, shoot these two targets, run over here, you got these three other targets. And I'll tell the students they have five minutes and then we'll get going. And some of them just kind of look at the targets and then sit down for five minutes and play with their phone. And when it comes up time to shoot, They'll get ready and sometimes forget what they're going to do. And then you'll have uh, students who are a bit more switched on. They've done some matches. Maybe they'll walk back and forth once or twice before they shoot it. And then you get the students who are really switched on, like they're already shooting A class, M class level, and they're treating it like a USPSA stage. And same thing during the make ready. Like some people, you say make ready, they just load the gun and they're ready. And other guys, you can see they're moving their head around and all right, here's something I'd say is a rule. People do as they rehearse. Yeah. So if they don't rehearse that much, they don't shoot the drill exercise or stage 
very aggressively, it looks like they're thinking their way through it. Yep. If they do rehearse it, they tend to do the thing that they rehearse. So if you see them rehearsing in a bad habit or something that's counterproductive, they tend to do it when it's uh, game time. Yeah, it's just watching dozens of students do this over the course of a year, the patterns become extremely obvious. Yeah. So the takeaway from that is I shoot the stage last and then I walk everybody through what I'm doing and I start the walkthrough of like, even before I load the gun, like how I'm visualizing it in my head. And for some people, like that's the first time they've ever heard of somebody doing that. Like the whole idea that I'd run oh, the whole thing through and that, that's just, that's new to them. And then the rest of the day, I mean, kind of you, you see everybody go in the morning, you, you know, you're going to see from them for the rest of the day and where to work on them. And I'm just really working with people on every drill, how to run through it in their head before they shoot it. Like what, what they should be thinking of. And then you just work on just levels of detail, like for the people who have never visualized before, just visualizing the spots they want to shoot in the target order. Like that's a good place to start. And once they catch that, you start like, okay, I want you to start visualizing what the sights are going to look like on each target and what the gun's going to feel like in your hand and what sort of trigger pull you're going to do. Just adding those layers of visualization on. That's been, yeah, that's probably been the biggest change this year. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, I have everybody shoot the stage again. And I make it really clear, like, look, you, you're warmed up. This is not an apples to orange, apples to apples comparison. So you're warmed up, but you've also been shooting all day. So you're kind of tired. And after everybody shoots, I ask them more, how did you approach the stage differently this afternoon than you did this morning? And a lot more is they understand they have to shoot the targets differently and the mental rehearsal, like a lot of people start talking about how they'd never really run through a, a detailed mental rehearsal before, but they were doing it. And I feel like a proud dad when I see some <laughs> new students who are just standing there and I can tell like they're making some gestures like, yeah, they're actually thinking through this before they shoot it. And in the morning, they just slap the gun in and we're ready to go or slap the mag in and we're ready to go. And in the afternoon, I can see they're actually thinking through what they're about to do. It's like my work here is done. <laughs> And yeah, what I say, what I'm saying lately in classes is, hey, when you understand and can articulate what's happening with your shooting, that's how you're really going to improve. Yeah. And I feel like you're kind of in the same boat with people where you're just getting them to understand what's happening better. Yeah, that's that's another another angle I want to hit on, too. Is this the uh, trying to coach people into being more introspective about their shooting and understand what they're doing. All right, Mr. Park, big changes this year. Have you made any? Let's talk uh, about it. Well, one thing that's, uh, I mean, I've, I've always been on this, on this kick, I suppose, but like when you're doing the demo or talking about the drill, I, I make it a point now to make it as simple as I can I mean, I'm constantly as simple as I can. So I'll like, I'll demo the drill. When I demo the drill, it'll be very deliberate. So for instance, Bunny Stacks, most people know uh, predictive shooting on the lower A zones, reactive shooting on the upper A zones. I don't try to do any predictive shooting on the upper A zones to like see how fast I can jam up a pair or something. It's like, it's very deliberate shooting. So I'm showing people exactly what I want them to do, talk about it. And then I don't spend all day like, man, like I've seen and been in classes where you talk like 20 minutes about the drill. It's like, hey, this is, the, oh, I'm going to do the drill. Let's talk about the drill. A few things that can go wrong as a, as a class. And then, you know, what we're looking for, what we're assessing, that's it. Like, start shooting the drill. And then once you get to that, I mean, people, I mean, through no fault of their own, it's not like they're not trying. People don't always have the awareness of how to obviously pick out the mistakes they're doing. That's why they're in class. So, like, the sooner you, like, you show the drill, you explain it, what we're, this is what we're here to do. You get people start cracking on the drill, and then they just get direct feedback. And then, like, you know, you talk about, like, gripping the gun harder. It'd be like, if I'd be like, hey, Ben, grip the gun harder. It'd be like, okay. Like, no, 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 no. I mean, like this. I put my support hand on the gun for them and crush yeah. and just, like, smashing their hand into the grip panels. I'm like, no, I'm talking about this. But like, oh. And then all of a sudden, like, this light bulb goes on. The eyes, like, get wide open. And then all of a sudden, they're, like, gripping the gun properly. 
or a guy this past week, like, hey, you keep tensing up your shoulders, like walk up behind him while he's shooting, like putting my hands on top of his shoulders, pushing down. It's like, no, stop doing this. Um, so anyway, it's like to, to say this in a short term, it's like you get straight to shooting and then like people, as, as I've seen, you know, people lack the awareness to know all the possible things their shooting could be doing. So they just start shooting the drill. You go up to them, you tell them exactly what's wrong. You like whether you have to like push down their shoulders or like, grip the gun for them or make sure it's a way that, uh, that they understand clearly. I'm like, that's that. You just cut straight to the chase and it's like, this is what's wrong. This is how you fix it. Hey, you know what, Joel? This kind of reminds me. So you've gotten into recently, you started doing military training. Uh-huh. And that was different for you, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then I think one thing that was big for you was noticing multiple repetitions of a drill and what a difference that makes for people. Yes. Why don't we talk about that? Well, uh, because I think this is a mistake that military or not, this is a lot of people need to hear this. I have a, a small sampling. So if keeping this pretty anonymous, uh, yeah. the feedback I got was the guys will have an ex- like literally an Excel sheet. It's like, all right, we're doing, uh, it'll be their drills. But like, all right, we're doing crisscross for this many rounds, doubles for this many rounds. We're going to do some group shooting for this many rounds, like mountain movement, this many rounds, whatever. And it's just like an art itinerary where you just go down the list, like you do this drill with this many rounds. And the point of it was, we ended up doing, we're out there, let's say we're out there for a, a day. It ends up being like four drills in a day for a group of guys and, you know, a, a lot of ammo. Let's say they shoot twelve to fifteen thousand rounds a day, something like that. Um, and so they like they get to keep experimenting on the drill and shooting as much as they want until I kind of like I can kind of read the room and I'm like, and I was like, hey, you guys ready to move on to the next drill? There'll be a handful of guys that maybe are like, no, we want more, or maybe it was like, yeah, I got it, ready to go on. But the feedback I got was before they didn't really get to experiment or shoot the drill enough to really understand what it was for me to pick on them enough to see all the things they need to work on or to take back to their dry training. So they kind of just did the drill. They executed what they were supposed to do, but didn't really have time to experiment, learn, get critiques, get feedback. It's not really beneficial. So anyway, they liked that it was like for for most, maybe it was five drills a couple days, but for the most part, like a couple hours per drill to really experiment with it and do the drill enough that they felt comfortable. And bro, I was like, I was super happy. But even by the end of day one, guys, like I could see when they're doing the drill, like they get done, they get unloading their stuff into the mag in or jamming mags. They're like shaking their head. It's like, yes, this guy gets it. I'm like, what do you, what's up? And he's like, oh man, I keep, I keep tensing up my firing hand. My shoulders keep going up. I'm standing like an idiot, you know, whatever it is. But they got to do the drill enough that they started to pick out when they were doing it wrong. They knew what to look for. And then they were like dissatisfied, which is good because that goes a long way towards fixing it. 100%. Yeah, good. Andreas, any reaction to that? I think uh, having that much ammo for students would be would be kind of nice. But um, I think also, are you like, how much are you trying to improve the students at the class versus sending them home with homework? I would always say- a big one. A handful of them are drastically different. That's, an, you that's a really interesting question. So that is a good question. I'll go to some stuff that it's an agency or a unit, and it's guys that are not really going to shoot on their own. So they're down to shoot with me during the workday, but there's no expectation that they're, they're going to do anything on their own. Yeah, and that's a very different group than a open enrollment civilian competition class where it's people that are experienced at shooting, have done a lot of matches, that sort of thing. They practice a lot, and they want to just get a little edge in their practice. That's what they're expecting to get out of class versus they're expecting like a guided practice. Also, skill level is quite quite important to that. So, like, for instance, this last week, I had like a... very much. I will say a a high A, low M class guy that's a frequent practicer. So for him, I'm showing him concepts and things, you know, stuff that he's doing to take back to his training. But there's also the B class guy that maybe doesn't practice a lot, but has a lot of blammo. So for that, like, this is really good because some of these people are a drastic shooter at the end of the week, like cracking off doubles at 
you know, 30 meters with a rifle. They're like, hey, this is like prep and press. I'm like, no, 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 no. You hold the rifle properly like this. And then you just press the trigger twice. By the end, they're amazed what they're doing. But that's a non-frequent, you know, I mean, that's a non-frequent practicer at, you know, a mid-level skill. So there's a lot of, a lot of low-hanging fruit compared to the A-class guy that already frequently trains and kind of knows what's up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the students I get in the open enrollment classes haven't shot competition that they've done indoor range training. And they're more just not sure what they should be doing or focusing on when they train on their own. So they've typically done some slow fire groups or tried to go a little rapid fire groups and that's really all they know. So part of the class that I'm giving them is these are things like these are some of the concepts and these are how you can practice them on your own. And typically the like the guided practice stuff, that's more when I do private training. It's be like two or three guys that have something specific they want to work on and they're not really sure, like, how should we go out and train this? Andreas, in your open enrollment or private classes, do you have like the who is my daddy and what does he do kind of talks where you're like, tell me your <laughs> name and, and what are you here to get out of the class and what do you hope to learn and where are you from and, you know, like that kind of stuff? Or do you just like get straight to the shooting and figure it out during the class? I do a real quick, uh, like I give everybody like hand out name tags for people to, to wear and do a real quick of uh, like, how do you find out about the class and tell me a little bit about your, your, your shooting background and what you think you need to learn. And I find that part interesting that I want to know what people think they need to learn. And then I want to watch them and see how that squares up with what I think they need to learn. Sure. Um, yeah. One thing I'm curious about, and I'll see if this, if this tracks with you guys, kind of, uh, the more, when I have a conversation with a student who wants to do like a private class or just get into a small class, they just want to have a conversation before they do it. The more experienced that they kind of pose as the less skill level I expect to see. Does that make sense? When they say, Hey, I've been shooting for 12 years and I've taken this in this class, then I don't expect them to be very good when I see them. But if they say, hey, I've been, tr I've been shooting for 18 months, been practicing a lot, I'm into all your stuff and reading these books and Joel, and you know the stuff that you wrote with Joel, like it's really good, I would expect a higher skill level from that person. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, if people just mention how long they've been shooting, I typically don't put a lot of stock in that. But isn't that isn't that interesting? Like, it is interesting. We, yes. Explain this to people in a way that makes sense. It's almost like uh, I've been commuting to work for twenty years, and I'm here for this F one class. <laughs> no, if I'm gonna do like a private lesson, it'll be, hey, do you have any match video? Like, I don't, I don't even need a dissertation. Just like if you have a full match video or a YouTube link, just send me that. Like in five minutes, I'll know what we're working with. Yeah. And then it'll just be like it was with private lesson. It'll be. You know, like, what are your what are your goals? What would you like to have as takeaways? Where do you want to get to? Or you, look, from, or you look them up on, or you look them up on practice score or look up some match results. Well, that too. But they, I mean, you might even if you know their classification or you could watch their video and tell how good they are. They might say, like, I really want to understand. Like I got a private lesson with the guy. He's like, I really just want to understand basic marksmanship fundamentals, reactive shooting, predictive shooting, target transitions. A little bit of mounted movement like that was the goal for the day he's like i really just go through everything with me i think i get it i really just want to get a grasp of the fundamentals mm -hmm. so like that's like just tell me where you know where you want to be at for the day but other than that i mean like if they want to talk i'm happy to but otherwise that, that's all i need to get rolling basically okay or you could watch them shoot cold you know you just like uh i'd homeboy come train with me and i do like hey i just want to see just just shoot a group it's like 15 15 uh, yards shooting a Glock and they're all like a fist size group and it's like fairly reasonable speed. I'm like, perfect. I'm like, all right. You're like, you know, what's up with shooting? Like, we're just going to skip straight to it. And like, that's, it's an easy way to just like, you can see by their demeanor, how the shooting is, how they handle their gun. Like that tells you a lot about just like where to get started and where, like how the day is going to go from, in my opinion, anyway. Um, yeah, I would say that's true. And I'm not, very often surprised is that a good way of putting it yeah yeah i mean it's it's just because sometimes you... i get a little surprise in there 
where I'll assess someone's ability or their capacity as one thing, and I'll see something else. Where I'm like, hey, I thought this person was going to be a stud, and they just can't do it. Or the reverse, like, hey, I thought this person was, you know, all kinds of fucked up, and they're really excelling. I'm not often surprised. And I, that's the same for you guys, right? Yeah. Yes. Although sometimes the people who aren't doing very well, once you start giving them a quick, swift kick in the rear, <laughs> they... um they pick up fast. Like they've just yeah. been really holding back. So what what do you think holds people back? I think there is a fear of missing or people are afraid to miss or make bad shots in practice. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I, I do think, like I don't like to talk about physical, physical ability too much, but one thing I've noticed is that there are smaller, kind of more frail looking people and they have the uh, they have the talent to shoot very well, but their hands just can't take the pounding. So they can shoot like, you know, a limited number of rounds, or they can shoot half a day in a in a in a class setting productively, and then after that they fall off really really dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, so I have noticed that there's people that get, they get held back physically just by what their hands can tolerate. Have you guys noticed the same? Yeah, I suppose. And even regardless of physical fitness, it depends on how much they train. Because if yeah. someone doesn't train often, their hands will be shredded and they'll be, you know, like they'll be done a lot quicker. Even if they're really enthusiastic and want to, just if they're not conditioned to shooting that much ammo and gripping the gun properly. Yeah, it's kind of like I always leave a bunch of athletic tape out by my range bag when I'm teaching and I tell all students like, hey, you're probably gonna need this later on in the day and maybe there'll be some chuckles, but like by lunchtime, people are kind of slinking off to start taping their hands up. Oh, I tape my hands up just before I even start. I do, I do as well. And people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, like you can see, see I have see. a half a half blood blister right here. Yeah. Even though I tape up before I start. Amazing. But so Joel, you were talking about with uh, like pointing out where students are making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so what I've started doing is in the morning when we're working on marksmanship and maybe some uh, initial target transitions, like just for, for, I start teaching target transitions by having the students point their guns at the, like everybody's on the line and they're pointing their gun at the, at their partner, like the next person's target. And then they transition to onto their target and fire. And I start giving a lot of, like I go over, read the targets and explain what they're doing wrong um, or how, how, to, how to improve. And kind of once we get that point, I start more asking them, what do you think's going on? To try to get them used to reading their own targets and interpreting what the results are. All so right. Kind of, like initially I'm laying out very clearly, like, look, when you're doing this, like I'm watching you shoot, I'm seeing where the bullets are going. Like I'm, Guys, I'm almost certain this is what the problem is. This is a great, that's a great thing. Like, hey, you want to get people used to reading their own targets. Uh -huh. So let's go around the horn, so to speak. What issues do you see with people reading their own targets? And I'll start. The thing I see most frequently with people is they kind of throw their hands up. They're like, oh, I was shooting it and it went wild. You know, like, oh, they, they went all over the place. And they'll they'll use language like that. But when I look at the target, the target is indicating a specific error. Like, hey, stuff is going to the left. Stuff is going left and low. Stuff is going high. It's not like it's going everywhere. It's a spe It looks like it's yeah. a, a specific thing. What I get a lot is I was shooting too fast. Yes. And oh, yes. And I just tell them that like, that's not an answer. Like. It's yeah. got to be something like going too fast doesn't push the rounds to the left or low or low left. Like there's something specific you're doing. So I just start digging like, well, and in some cases I really aren't sure. And I just ask them, like, I kind of know what the answer is. I'm like, okay, we're going to shoot this drill again. And I want you to really focus on your firing hand. And just like, do you feel like, tell me, like, do you feel it tensing up as you're, as you're going? 
And then we'll we'll talk again after the next round. They're like, yeah, I could feel my firing hand starting to tense up as I as I sped up. I'm like, okay, so you weren't going too fast. You were tensing up your firing hand, and that was sending the shots off. And then you start seeing some like the lights, the lights come on. Like they it clicks. Like, hey, this is like there's a specific reason that the shots aren't going where I want them. It's not just I was going too fast. Another Mr. problem is people can't get out of their own way. So it'll be like, you know, it's more sunny than it normally is. I have a different pair of uh, shooting glasses that I normally use. <laughs> I'm drinking. I feel purple. personally yeah. attacked right now, Joel. How yeah, dare you, sir? I hate those glasses. Uh, I'm drinking purple, purple drink, and I'm normally drinking the red one. Uh, this is a different gun. Wait, uh, you hate these glasses that I'm wearing right now? They're so ridiculous, Ben. How dare you? These uh, are amazing. I had a different thing for breakfast. I slept on a different side. I mean, all this crap. And it's like, no, no, like, just like, what's what's going on here? You're clamping out with your firing hand. You're not picking spots on targets, whatever. But people, they can justify it to themselves any way they want to. This ammo is really hot. Uh, I'm not trained up. I'm tired. I'm too much caffeine, whatever you want. So it's important to like to help people wade through all that garbage and kind of like zoom out and be like, no, no, no. If this was like somebody else you were you were talking to, what would you tell them to do? Hey, like, can we speak about getting trained up, Mr. Joel? Sure. So you made a big change in your equipment to get ready for the uh, Special Forces gig that mm -hmm. you went on. Yeah. So you switched over to shooting Glock and rifle combo, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think people find that interesting. Well, uh, I didn't know it was exactly coming, but Lucas ended up sending me a full rig. So I got out of the I oh, I got UPS box. I'm like I see T Rex stuff on the top. I'm like, oh cool. Open this thing up. I'm like, well, it's a rig. And I'm like, and I'm leaving in a week and a couple of days. So I'm like, I think about it for a little bit. I'm like, yep, it fits my gun. Go figure. It fits my gun. Mag's perfect. All right, all right. I'm using this. So then at that point on, I just started dry firing with it. Uh, I don't know, anywhere from three to five times a day, probably. Uh, I'd go to the range. I'd either wake up early and go to the range before work. Or I'd cut out of work early and go to the range. Um, I'd shoot, I don't know. I, I literally didn't care how much ammo I shot. If it was like a thousand rounds a week, it was two thousand. I, I don't really care. I just kept kept loading magazines and shooting. Uh, dry training, like I said, three times a day was probably the minimum. Now, you, you were, like, let's be real, you were a little bit nervous about this. Yeah. Because you're going to a new organization and you wanted to perform well. And that's good. Yeah. And, all right, did your training work? work perfect yeah so when you went and shot your demos you're just like hey just shoot it nice and chill pace it was definitely impressive enough it, it was what it needed to be right mm -hmm. perfect so yeah uh just just try to train myself the very best i could with the amount of time i had yeah being, being prepared is important all right mr andreas anything to fill in there any shit you want to talk about, Joel? Nothing. Yeah, I mean the the, the demo pace. I I just try treat demos like I would. I'm shooting something in a match. Yes. Where you you're basically you you're held accountable for every round. Yeah. And if I do make a mistake, I just kind of walk the students through what happened. You know what? Like like there's, it's, like it's going to go wrong at some point. Like there's going to be makeup shots. I'm gonna miss a piece of steel or like the gun's going to come out of the holster wrong. Yeah. And it's like, you know, yes. Before we knock off this podcast, I want to talk about demoing things wrong. I've started to emphasize that maybe the last three years. I wish I'd done it sooner. I feel like such an idiot, but demonstrating things wrong. Uh, what value do you see in that? Uh, Joel, let's start with you. Oh, dude, you, it's, I, I know yeah. you demo shit wrong a lot. Yeah, it's super tough as a as an instructor. I'm sitting there like, all right, what exactly do I want to do? And I'm like, I have to plan it all through my brain. And so, well, for instance, uh, we're doing Blake drill. It was at like 10 yards, Blake drill, uh, seven yards with the guys. And uh, so I'm like, okay, I want to drag through the middle target. Like, what does that look like? Like, you see, like in the middle target, you start to see brown, press the trigger. Don't stop the gun. When you get towards the end of the target, see brown again. Make sure you look at precise spots in the left and the right target. So I'm like, I'm playing that through my brain because I don't want it to just on autopilot to do it properly for this instance. Like, okay, like watch the gun, you know, we're, you know, tell me what's going on. So you do the drill, like hammer two in the center of the target, 
like Charlie Delta, whatever, and out, out opposite ends of the target, and then two A's on the, on the left or on the I'm sorry on the right target. It's like all right, let's talk about what happened. Like so, we start. You know, it's really good to create the conversation. Like, did I did I pick the wrong spot on the target? Like, uh, well, yeah, maybe. Like, no, tell me more. Like, what did I do wrong? So maybe like you didn't stop the gun. I'm like, okay, now we're now we're getting somewhere. So yeah. anyway, it's really important that, if, from my opinion, when you demo it wrong, you have like you you do it wrong in a way that people are going to actually do, and someone watching you could be like. That makes sense. Well, like yes, to I've me, tried swinging through that target. Yeah, to me, you take any drill and I demo shooting it properly, and then I demo shooting it, staring at my red dot, shooting confirmation three on everything, mm -hmm. which would be seeing the dot recover and stop and look like a red dot for every shot. Mm -hmm. So you take any drill, shoot it properly versus shoot it, staring at my dot for for everything, confirmation three. And it's eye opening for people when they see it where they're like, oh, shit, like that other way. Like, yeah, you were just wasting a bunch of time and it was really obvious what you were doing wrong. But it can't be just you hammering on a drill and pushing to the point of misses and then be like, wow, I had a miss here. Let's talk about it. Like, no, 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 no. Like before you demo, you already have the specific thing that you want to emphasize. And it needs to be something that people in the class are going to be doing wrong or a common issue, in my opinion. Like on uh, bar hop, I do that a bunch because that's for people who, who are like haven't shot competitively or even people who are new to competitive shooting. I think bar hop is the first drill I present that's really challenging in how it requires them to isolate their upper and lower bodies. Yes. And and yeah, there are I mean, there are there number of there's plenty I've seen plenty of mistakes I've seen on how shots get drug and why they get drug that demoing that incorrectly, I think is a pretty big help for people. But even then I, I give everybody a shot at the drill before I start doing those demos of, of how it looks wrong. I just let everybody do it, get a feel for it. Cause I feel like it's like a lot of the showing things right versus showing things wrong is academic until they've experienced the drill or experience the type of shooting in the drill and once they've That's done a it, good point yeah or at least have made an attempt they just kind of have some context for the demo i think it depends on the demo it depends on the drill and it depends on the demo for example track the a zone so you got a couple of barrel stacks or vision barriers with targets back behind them and you demonstrate walking and shooting basically yeah. and you don't want to dismount the gun or have the vision barrier pose any sort of issue, I think people understand immediately, like, when you do that too close to the vision barrier and you're pulling the gun in and out, you know, I think people get that right away. Whereas if I'm shooting a drill and I do target transitions like MXAD, you know, if I'm focused on the, the, the dot during the target transition, that's a much more subtle error. And people need to almost need to be shooting the drill. Then they kind of get it. They're like, oh, I understand that. I see that. Yeah. I think also with track the A zone, that that's not the first. You're not going to teach that as your first shooting on the move drill. I might. I'm nuts, though. <laughs> You're nuts, yeah. I'm I mean, for, for, for that is actually kind of the first one I do now. Oh, I mean, for like when I show people bar hop, like if somebody's only ever shot in an indoor range, that's gonna that that might be the first time they've really moved with yeah. a firearm. And that one's like mind blowing. Yeah, it's yeah. mind blowing, and that's like they they really need to to do that drill a couple times before I start showing any sort of nuances on it, just so they get a feel for what what's going on and what the challenges are. Mr. Park, do you have anything intelligent or otherwise to say? Uh, I think this all makes sense. The last yeah. thing I was going to say, uh, maybe it was a few, few topics back. The thing I want to talk about is just uh, coloring outside the lines is super important. And I think there are far too many people that don't do that. We were talking earlier about mistakes being stigmatized, whether yes. it's like for work or not. There's recreational shooters that always want to make sure they hit everything, you know, to have the shots centered up. Yes. So like the, the confirmation system, super important. But where you Shoot. just went and worked, like regular, like special operations guys, mm -hmm. you would say 
it was difficult to push them outside of that comfort zone. Yeah. So they for, could see those mistakes for and sure. make it really I, improve, right? It may, it may be in some circles, it's like life or death if you hit the target yeah. or don't. Mm -hmm. exactly. So like, if it's possibly life or death, you wouldn't want to miss the target. So it's very important that the bullets go where you intend them to. So I understand the justification for that, but it's like, you're not gonna get any faster or learn anything if you just keep, you know, like we, yeah. we call confirmation through a stop stable dot every time you shoot, it's always a stop stable dot. All right, yeah. So there's one other lesson I wanted to talk about that I've learned a lot this year and that I've seen guys learning and that's body tension. So the drill in and out, if you're not familiar with it, it's you have some steel straight down range. You're going to be shooting those. You have a target off at a 90 degree angle from that steel. And it's basically steel, target, steel, target, steel. And there's a lot of lateral movement while you're doing it. Once it calls the drill in and out. Um, what's interesting about that drill is I've really seen it highlight for people how much tension in their body affects the pre the precision of target transitions sure so yeah so because you have those 90 degree swings and you're constantly moving on that drill popping in and out of position mm -hmm. it really highlights that for you and i've seen that be just a game changer for people this year i agree the correction normally is like well the other thing people intellectually need to understand is you only hold the gun with just your hands Mm -hmm. And people want to use like their shoulders or I'll like I'll make it a point to say, especially like, well, like whatever, the, like the, the group I was working with would be like, hey, the fact that you're more physically fit in every possible way does nothing for you as far as marksmanship fundamentals of the handgun. And so I like to make a point because it's really true. You just hold the gun with your hands, like your chest, arms, back, none of that stuff. You don't engage that. And, uh, you know, I think some people. Sometimes people that are really physically fit, they want to use that to help them hold the gun or they want to be really rigid or shoulders come up or, you know, posture changes, whatever, to really help manage the gun. I think that's why, you know, doing demos that explain like how little the gun recoils and how important just, you know, returning the gun with your eyes is, is super important. But uh, tension is a big thing for a lot of people. So intellectually, it's super important to understand you just hold the gun with your hands. I think with tension, one thing that's helpful is to encourage people to, after they finish a drill, to not dismount the gun, but just to freeze in place and then evaluate the tension in their body before they reholster. I mean, it only takes a couple, like a two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. Like maybe yeah. they, like something like in and out, maybe they draw the gun and they're kind of relaxed. Then you have them shoot the drill. And when they shoot the steel the last time, just have them stop. I'm like, okay, how's... How's your hand tension? How's your your shoulder tension? And if they just yeah. find that they're stiff as a board afterwards, like, yeah, that happens. Yeah. Stop doing that's that. A, yes, that's a great thing. And on bar hop, you'll see the same thing. You're you're gonna shoot the drill, then you build build up tension. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, any other big lessons learned this year teaching? So we did the uh the discrete aim points, the dot occlusion, those two things together have helped us sort out a lot, like focusing on you know small spots on the targets, mm -hmm. how important that is. In and out has helped with attention. Mm -hmm. Bar hop with that as well. Yeah, teaching visualization. It's teaching people yes. how to read how, teaching people how to read targets, getting them used to doing that. I Maybe mean, that's a lot in a year. Yeah. Anything else, Mr. Park? Before we uh, call it, nothing comes to mind. We should talk about uh, how much, when enough, enough as far as switching uh, handgun platforms. I think. Tell we, what do you mean by that? Let's talk about it. Well, I don't. So like Andreas putting on blast. Andreas had nothing but problems with Berettas. It's mm -hmm. uh, like he's he's cracked. He's cracked what two barrels now? That is yeah. Like so, and two barrels have cracked where they're like not usable. Before that, you had extraction problems where you did some, I wouldn't even have the patience, some like pop rivet or some washer or some garbage you did to make the guns at least feed. I realize I'm being a little yeah. bit harsh, but it's pretty factual. So you've had feeding no, 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 problems. That's totally true. Feeding problems you've worked through with both guns. One gun never worked right. 
now you have barrels, your second barrel. So you're like, God what? damn. So it's like, when's enough's enough? I'm like, I, I like, I literally don't care what I have invested in them. They'd be gone or in a pile somewhere, and I would have something else. Like I, I do not have patience for stuff that doesn't work. And I'm like, I'm pretty cheap, honestly. Like I don't, I try to spend money on dumb stuff, but uh, I, like I don't. If equipment doesn't work, it's gone. So like, how long do you do you keep trying to make that work? And when do you when do you abandon ship? And another question would be. Like, how much of your skill is associated with that platform? And are you just good at shooting where you could give Andreas any gun? And he's going to be Shreddy Krueger. Like, if I give him <laughs> one, of these, one of these PDPs. Yeah, well, you know, Joel, I haven't ever messaged you lately while I'm dry firing and said, have you ever had this problem hitting the mag release or inadvertently hitting the mag release? I or, know. And you used to do that. I used to do that a lot. I haven't done that with the Berettas. So... Um, yeah, I mean, like winning, like getting two production section wins, like that kind of gives me a soft spot for the gun. It, I so. agree with Andreas. If he's winning with it, he should want to preserve it. So it's worth it to try to figure out the issue to see what's going on. I would say. Right, because you've had barrel, like the barrel or the barrel lug or something has broken yeah. in two guns precisely the same. Yeah. Is that what it is? All yeah. right. So it's a specific thing. If Beretta can figure it out and they can fix it and you're satisfied, like, yep, this makes this, sense. This they is good. Fixed it. And that's some um, that's what I'm waiting to hear. Like I've emailed some people at Beretta and I would uh, give it a chance personally. That's what I'm that's thinking. Like if I if I get an answer that's that's fixable. Like, yeah, I'll stick with it. If they're just, if they shrug their shoulders, like, yeah, some of the guns just don't work. Like, okay, I'm getting the hell You're out of here. It's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. You sirs can fuck off. Yeah. 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 And yeah then, then, then I got to make those guns somebody else's problem. Maybe I'm just too obsessive about gear, but I'd be like, hey, how long does this one have until it's going to break? And that would always be in the back of my mind. I can't help yeah. myself. That's just the way I'm wired. Yeah. So well, I, I know. It, it's, it's, it's about, uh, it's 20,000 rounds. And the barrel's gonna start cracking on you. God damn! <laughs> I would just always have that in the back. Like, what if it's yeah. a fifteen thousand round barrel? Yeah. What if this what? is a ten thousand round barrel? Yeah, we just stop at ten. Like, once the match gun hits ten k, Jesus, yeah. I was just curious. It's interesting because I don't. I just man. Yeah. I'm not, I have enough things like that. I'm concerned about like having my gear be like the ammo be up to par or my. Whatever yeah, I, guns functioning, like that's one thing I don't add to the list. Like that just has to work. Yeah, if I had to do it over again, I never would have gotten rid of the uh, SPO one shadows. Those oh, I remember jam. when I met you, you were a nerd with those shadows. This was yeah. maybe ten years ago. Yeah, I was shooting those guns when I met you, also, Ben. All right, hey guys, let's talk about uh, PSTG Summit. What is the plan right now? <laughs> uh, I think we saw some details to work out. Well, we have dates. Yeah, so working out, I think it's going to be March 31st and then April 1st and 2nd. Yeah. At uh, South River Gun Club. I'm waiting to hear. I, I worked everything out. There's going to be a match that weekend. So that's within an hour of the Atlanta airport, ATL. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So good timing, I think, because... It doesn't interfere with a bunch of other stuff. It's just too early in the year, right? Yeah, the, the South Carolina section match is the week before that. Yeah, so it should be good. It should, it should good. work for everyone. It's not on Easter? It is not on Easter, no. So, so yeah, we're, uh, I said there's going to be a match that weekend, but uh, the director is a buddy of mine, and we have a way to shape, share base that's going to work out, I think. Andres has all the friends. Yeah. Mr. Park, anything to add? No, sign me up. That sounds good. Uh, well, you're I the those, signing people up here. I know those, those dates were for sure firmed up. I should drop those on training group. You yeah, actually should drop those on training group. Yeah, we got uh, we got an email into the match to, to the uh, the club owner, but uh, I'm not anticipating trouble there. Like I've already talked to him about hosting it and what it's going to cost, and we seem to have an agreement there. Perfect. Well, we'll... Uh, We'll I'd, say we're, I'd, I'd say we're 95 percent of the way there well that sounds okay yeah well i guess we'll need to work out the rest of the deals of uh, the details and then yeah if training group people want to go 
We definitely should. This sounds like it'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. Banger. Yeah. All right. Listeners, if you have a question you'd like the answer to, go to bensteger.com. Send me your question. Aside from that, you two guys, this was a, a banger podcast. I feel like we all learned a lot this year. 10 out of from 10. Teaching. 10, 10 out of 10. 11, yeah, 10. 11, 11 out of 10. <laughs> well, now, Andreas, you've learned how to teach people with reduced round count. Yeah, I'd say I've been working on that for a while. And Mr. Yeah. Park has now pushed into the special operations market. So he's basically the Mark, the Mike lover of uh, shooting training, which is amazing. Right, Mr. Park? Yeah, I need a Hydra mount. You do need a Hydra, hydra mount. mount. <laughs> yeah, glove.